And we are live. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matthew Kressel here with Ellen Datlow. Tonight's guests are Nancy Kress and Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, Stan is with us. He's just uh, in an undisclosed location. There he is. He's but waving. He's freezing, uh, so we're not keeping His bandwidth is not great. Um, so we're sticking with audio for now, but not to worry. We have a Awesome <laughs> author photo that we can overlay when it's his time to read. Um, but yes, uh, I'm I'm really excited about uh, about the readings tonight. Um, you know, both both of you guys are some of my favorite authors, and uh, this stars. is what's that? They're stars. You guys are great. I mean, yeah, like when I first started getting into uh, writing, Nancy, you know, your one of your textbooks was. Uh, you know, was part of the course. I remember that. Yeah, the middles and endings. That's supposed to be a really good one. I've heard. Yeah, and uh, you know, I both both of you. I've read a uh, you know, a lot of your stuff. So it's it's cool to have you on uh, as guests tonight. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, I wanted to do KGB my whole career, and um, I wish it was in person in Brooklyn. I, I must it's say, it's not in Brooklyn. We're not in Brooklyn. We're in Manhattan. East Village. What? Yeah. Um, was that always true? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there, there are other reading series, but uh, yeah. KGB has been in East Village. Stan, you were lusting. Yeah. In, you were lusting after the wrong girl. Well, I'm a California guy, and I, I understood uh, people would come to Terry Bisson and Judy after KGB, and it seemed to me they had come from somewhere in Brooklyn, but. Um, be in Manhattan, so let's go. But next time, yes, yeah, we'll be, <clears throat> party, back we'll be, yeah, we'll be back in, in person October. in October. Our October reading is going to be the first live one or in person one. It's with Mike DeLuke and Daryl Gregory. Yeah, oh, you yeah. know, I just had this conversation with um, there's someone who I'm going to be doing a virtual chat with in Second Life, and he's all annoyed because apparently. People are using what we're doing is virtual, but he considers virtual reality stuff only virtual reality and never the twain shall meet. And I said, I'm sorry, but virtual words evolve. You've lost. I've been fighting against sci fi for 30 years. I lost the battle. You can fight as long as you want for virtual, but no, virtual conferences, virtual readings, they're virtual and you lose. <laughs> You've lost. Yeah. Partly because there isn't another good word. I know. Describe this. You know, he just wanted to keep virtual for the cyberpunk stuff. Ah. You know, it's like so too bad. It sounds like you know the French, you know, word police. You know, you can't can't use uh, email. You have to use courriel. Oh, really? I never heard of that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they still do that, but this was years ago. <laughs> Hi, Mike Zipser. Hi, Joseph Kennedy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you we'll just actually be in. starting in about ten. 15 minutes. Yeah, we're just hanging out now. This is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think both of you, if I, I recall your names from previous streams, so you you know who we are. Uh, we'll do another <laughs> announcement in a little while. But uh, yeah, this this is going to be a good, good show tonight, I think. Okay, I can't put up a comment. I'm not supposed to do that, right? You can't. You can, talk, um, you can say you, could, you can speak, but you can't. Yeah, why don't you speak it? Because um, not everyone's going to have access to the live okay. comments. Hi, Mike. That was my comment. Oh, not okay. Not yes. Actually, brilliant, but there it is. Yes. Mike Zipser writes, uh, and I'll put it up here. Two of my favorite writers. Yes. Mine too. So ah. thanks. thanks for joining us, Mike and Amy. Hi, Carol. Yes, hello. Hi, John and Carol. Hello. And Amy. And Amy, yeah. So yeah, people are coming in, come into the bar, as we say. <laughs> Bring your own drinks. <laughs> right. That's a disadvantage of doing it virtually. You That's can't true. go into the bar, as it were, and get a drink. No, you can only bring your own seltzer or whatever. You can still tip the bartenders, though. And how would I do that, man? How would <laughs> you do that virtually? There's a paper Funny, you ask. Funny you ask, Nancy. Uh, we actually um, have a little link here. So the, the KGB bar, they, they actually just opened. Um, you know, New York City is, you know, you can go indoors now to bars and restaurants. But um, yeah, for during the pandemic, they had a um, 
fundly, you know, like a crowdsourcing thing where you can donate to the bar. So we've been asking our viewers to, you know, give a few dollars here and there, like the cost of a drink, just to help them out, to keep them going. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've also been giving them a little bit of money each month um, just to support them. Cause we, you know, we want to go back there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a link. I, at the I guess you can't. I mean, you can't show off your beer stein. That there are no comments. You can't post anything. I assume, right? It's not like um, Facebook Messenger or Zoom where you can post pictures. No, you can't post pictures. Um, Amy but, got her Columbia with beer stein, and I'd like. I'll to tell you what, Amy. <laughs> you, if you have my email, email it to me, and I'll see if I can put it up on the screen. I can do banners with this thing. So. Uh, if you if you want, you don't have no pressure or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, that um, I wanted to add had to hear that Daryl Gregory is appearing in October. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He was a student of mine at Clarion in 1988, <laughs> and, um, wow. and he's on fire these days. He's one oh, of yeah. the one he's of the got great a new novella out. Yeah. Dr. Moreau, something about, I have that someplace. He's been blowing my mind. He's just so good these days. I'm very proud of him and happy for him. And I'm reading him with um, huge pleasure. So it's sure to be fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love Daryl and, and um, I've been reading his stuff for a while too. I, I haven't read his uh, his latest, but um, yeah. And then the other reader that month is, is Mike DeLuca and um, he writes, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, this kind of surreal, um, you know, uh, like kind of Kelly Link style where it's it's fantastical, but it's also an element of realism and it just weaves back and forth between the two. He's really, he's a really good writer and, and so humble like that you, 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 you don't see him ever really toot his own horn about it, but he's a great writer. So I think it's a good match, the two of them. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the work. Yeah. <clears throat> That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, we have to figure out what we're going to do about uh, the live stream. Uh, we do, we've always had, well, not always, since 2015, we've had a podcast where we just do the audio. Um, so I don't think I'm going to do live video. Or I don't think we're going to do live video of the event because I think it's just too much for to, you know, try to be a, you know, video engineer and host it at the same time. So I might just record it and then edit it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. Yeah, but we do want to continue with the Q and A's, but we have to figure out how to do it logistically. If we yeah. have, people can maybe give us questions when they come in or something, like write them out. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Hey, Linda. Hey, Linda. Linda, congratulations. She won the Riesling Award. Congrats. Oh, I didn't hear that. Congratulations, Linda. The Riesling or Riesling? I would think Riesling, but I don't know. Riesling. Congratulations. Yeah, so Linda was uh, poetry. used to come uh, to the to the reading, and then she moved away. But uh, it's good that she can join us through this. I mean, you know, um, the good thing about this, you know, live stream is that we can get people from all over the world tuning in live and, you know, um, you know, maybe they can't come to the restaurant and have dinner with their favorite author, but they can, uh, you know, see them live and ask a question and have them answer it. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, what was our record, Ellen, for the furthest away, like from New York? I think who I mean, read or who were attending? Either. I mean, I, I know we had South from, Africa, we had Pakistan. From, Oops, one from Pakistan, weren't Pakistan, they? Australia, I guess, <laughs> technically maybe the furthest. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. And it was good. I mean, it's been good that we can get people. I mean, it didn't, initially we had people scheduled, so we didn't point to the idea that, oh, we can get people from all over the world to read if they're yeah. willing to do it at the right time. <laughs> so, you know, we finally figured out, oh, let's get people from far away who never get here to read for us. So we had some really interesting, you know, international readers <clears throat> like Lauren Bukas and Priya Sharma and Karen Warren. 
-hmm. So when you go live, you're going to have to lose that aspect of it. Yes. 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 Back to yeah. local. So people, well, people who come to town. Yeah. I mean, by October, you know, hopefully if this Delta variant doesn't explode, um, you know, things we're hoping people will feel comfortable coming into a bar and, and mm -hmm. you know, having drinks and hanging out. Mm -hmm. People want to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've been in a few places. Um, I actually went to, uh, I, I think most people might be familiar with Grady Hendrix. He's a horror writer. Uh, uh, he, yeah. yeah. He had a book release party uh, on Friday and that was probably the first time I was in, you know, out. It was, it was in person. Where was it? A place called Powerhouse at the Abbey, which is in Dumbo, oh. uh, the bookstore. Mm -hmm. Really nice bookstore. You know that famous iconic picture of Brooklyn Bridge that you always see? Mm -hmm. it's taken from that street in the bookstore oh, okay. right there on the corner. Uh, nice place. And Grady's a great um, presenter. He, do, he does these like horror presentations, mm -hmm. uh, like rapid fire and really funny and, and witty and it's it a good show. But it was, it was the first time I was really out with uh, people. Well, you know, I want to, we're going to, well, Matt, <coughs> there's a dim sum place opening down a few blocks from me. Yeah. And once it does, I want to get a crowd together to go. Okay. I remember right before the pandemic hit, you were going to get dim sum. Yeah, we went. We did go dim sum. Oh, you did go? Oh, okay. Yeah, to Chinatown, the oldest dim sum parlor in Chinatown. This place is apparently an off offshoot of another place in Chinatown. I don't know when it's opening. I mean, it's still boarded up, but they just signed the lease. So hopefully in a few months. All yeah, right. Between 13th and 14th Street and 1st Avenue. I, I want to add that Grady Hendrix is also a clarion this time class of 2009 instead oh, of class of nine, 1988 with Daryl and Grady also is on fire and I yeah. can well imagine seeing him live is really a really a thrill he's great yeah, stuff very personable. a lot of fun mm -hmm. yeah I mean the research that he does for these presentations is kind of insane um, yeah <laughs> I, I remember for his nonfiction book uh, paperbacks from hell. I think he said he read something like 450 novels, to, you know, and and then you know, but it, he it wasn't just reading them, but he had analyzed them and had statistics on them, and you know, all sorts of crazy stats that I you wouldn't think, you know, he would have to go through each one and make little notes and markings, and, and it was just crazy. And yeah, I mean, he just he just loves it. It's very obvious when when you hear him uh, talk, but. Uh, yeah, so if you're just tuning in, this is uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Um, I'm Matthew Kressel. I host it with Ellen Datlow. Tonight's guests are Kim Stanley Robinson and Nancy Kress. Uh, heavy hitters, heavyweights. If you don't know who they are, where the hell have you been? Uh, seriously, these... these uh, Mike, what are you in for? Mike, are you in for going to Dim Sum or something else? Yeah, Mike's like, like we're, we're, saying, we're in. Yeah. Yeah, you might have to wait a minute. There's a little delay in the in right. The <clears throat> um, yeah, but uh, we'll be starting in a bit. We'll be starting in a minute. Um, oh yes, Mike. Okay, yes. When it opens, yeah, we'll all okay. go there. I don't know how big the place is, but I mean, I still like. We can go to Chinatown anytime. I want to go for dim sum. You know, let's plan. Let's plan it. Forget about this new place. Let's just go to Chinatown and do it. Is this like the place on Elizabeth Street where they sit you at a giant table with other people, and the tablecloth hasn't been cleaned in weeks? And I'm sure that's not going to happen anymore. I'm sure they're cleaning things much more like. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and sure then they come around. The place on 14th on 13th Street, I think, is high end, and I don't know how big it is. Though. Yeah, and then they come around and, and they say, because I don't really eat shrimp, I don't like shellfish. Mm -hmm. And I say, is this shellfish? I said, what is this? It's fish, you know. And then they give the stamp and it's in Chinese. I don't read it. I'm like, all right, what's this fish? What's this? Fish. Everything's fish. <laughs> I love shrimp. But anyway, yeah, I love dim sum. <clears throat> but you have to, and I actually, I'm, I'm going to dim sum on Friday in Hoboken, but only three people. So it's oh, nice. not too much fun, but still. 
<laughs> we can stuff ourselves. All right. So um, it's about 10 after. Should we get started? Sure. Okay. Nancy, you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, just real quick. Um, I know I repeat myself a lot on this, but this is, I just want, for the sake of people who are new, uh, this is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matthew Kressel. I co-host the series of Ellen Datlow. It's been going since the late 90s. Um, normally we hosted the KGB bar because of the pandemic, we've been doing it online. This is our 17th month doing it online. We're going back to the bar in October. And as Stan said, with the great Daryl Gregory and the great Michael DeLuca. So, uh, we hope that those of you who can make it um, will do will do that. And then we're working on something to figure out how we're going to um, record video of the event. We don't know exactly how we're going to do that yet. Same thing with Q and A. We want to do a Q and A after, but that has the logistics of that have to be worked out. Yeah. So. Um, take if, me, take me, take me. <laughs> um, if you can, uh, we, we kindly ask that you uh, support the KGB bar. They've been hosting the series since the late 90s. There's never a cover charge. Um, you know, it's one of the great literary venues of New York City, according to the New York Times. We agree. Um, if you can give them the cost of a drink, you can do so at the link below. Uh, they would really appreciate it. And we want to keep them going because we want to keep hosting the series there. Um, plus, they're awesome. They're awesome people. Uh, the other thing is uh, our series itself, the Fantastic Fiction at KGB, our series requires a little bit of money to run. Um, we, uh, as I said before, we give the, the bar a little bit of money. Uh, we used to take the the authors out to dinner. We don't do that anymore, obviously, because we can't. We will we, again. We will once we, we have. We will once again, but we do give them a little stipend, which I need to uh, talk to you guys about afterward. And then... Um, uh, we also, uh, the, the streaming service that we use costs a little bit of money. So if you can, you know, enough about asking for money, if you can, there's the link. If not, no worries. We still love you anyway. Um, all right. So our first guest is Nancy Kress. Nancy is the multiple award winner of science fiction and the occasional fantasy. Her Even most more once in a while. Not in real. Once in a while, right. Her <laughs> most recent works are the standalone novella, Sea Change, about the genetic engineering of crops and the space opera, The Eleventh Gate, based in Seattle with, and then there's a missing word there, with somebody. Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm just reading off the bio here. Based in Seattle what? with something. Uh, you can fill us in, Nancy. Nancy divides my husband, husband Jack, writer Jack Skillingstead. I can't Jack believe Skillingstead. that. I'm so sorry. I'm sure I didn't <laughs> miss the pace. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably so, Jack. Yeah. All right. Based in Seattle, period, or comma, Nancy divides her time between writing and trying to train a very stubborn, stubborn Chihuahua puppy. Sorry, my phone just blasted. Writing and trying to train a very stubborn, stubborn Chihuahua puppy. Here's Nancy Cress. <laughs> Thank you, Ned. <laughs> I am going to read from. Oops. Okay. I am going to read from Sea Change, which is a standalone novella from Tachyon that came out last year. 2032, Seattle, Washington. The house was clearly lost. I watched from my seat on the second story balcony of the Cinnamon Cafe as the tiny house, a 10 by 15 imitation Cape Cod with a single dormer, wavered in the middle of the intersection below. It turned to the left, to the right, back to the left, ending up crosswise to the intersection. Traffic honked and stopped. The house didn't budge, probably recalibrating. An ancient Lexus with an ancient driver tried to swerve around the house, but there wasn't enough room. The driver leaned out and shouted at the house, as if that would do any good. Whoever was inside had the shutters closed. Several homeless who were not supposed to be in this historic preservation neighborhood jeered and laughed. The robo server wheeled up to my table. Can I bring you something else, ma'am? I waved it away. My beer was only half drunk and the show below was too entertaining to gulp the rest, even though I would be late to meet the new recruit. Let him wait. From now on, his life would include a lot of waiting. The old man in the Lexus, surprisingly spry, jumped out of the car and pounded on the door of the house. 
nothing. People in cars, both drivies and manual, leaned out of their windows looking impatient. One of the homeless threw a plastic cup at the house's back wall. It missed. A few pedestrians stopped to watch, smiling, probably gloating that they weren't the one whose important rushing was being interrupted by an edifice with confused GPS. Still, the house didn't move. Mobile conveyances this large weren't permitted on city streets unless occupied, although that didn't guarantee that the occupants weren't asleep or drunk or too busy having sex to notice that their dwelling wasn't moving. At the very least, by now the mandatory pull-to-curb auxiliary engine should have engaged. Somewhere in the distance, a siren sounded, probably cops trying to get through the increasingly snarled traffic. Grinning, I leaned forward for a better view, and that's when I saw the windowsill below a closed shutter. Simultaneously, my pocket pinged, just once. Not my phone, the D. It only operated at a distance of fewer than 25 feet to avoid electronic surveillance. I walked down the stairs, forcing myself to not hurry, to look like any other person strolling around Pioneer Square in the rare October sunshine. The ping from my D was significant, but it was the paint on the windowsill that propelled me, a specific and ugly shade called Tiffany Teal. The famous New York jewelry store should have sued over the name. The paint company, after spectacularly bad sales, had discontinued the color. Tiffany teal was roughly the color of wet cleanser and it went with no other color in the known universe. It was the first thing that every new recruit memorized, drilled until they could distinguish it from azure, leaf, evening sky, and pale turquoise. We possessed gallons of it, all that was left in the United States, in multiple discrete locations. Every organization needs a signature color, Eric Kitson had said, among his other stupid utterances. Blues are cops. Reds are communists, unless you live in Boston, where they're a baseball team. Oranges are historic Irish enemies. Pinks are a girl band. I could go on, but the argument was too dumb. Eric Kitson was dead, and Tiffany Teal paint was used only to signal the presence of the org. It was useful only for line of sight, but on the other hand, it couldn't be hacked, unlike all other forms of communication, and the org knew better than to trust what the government or software companies said about digital security not since Kitson's murder. The house had a single step leading to its single door. The driver who'd pounded on the door had retreated in disgust. He sat in the front seat of his car, shouting into his phone. In one of the backed up cars, not too far away, a child wailed. Surreptitiously, I pinged open the door with my D, turned to give a theatrically amazed look to onlookers, and ducked inside to the blatting of the alarm system. The cop siren was much closer now. I had only a minute or two. There was nobody in the tiny house. It had a loft bed, no time to search up there. A galley kitchen, fold down table, two easy chairs, bookshelves, a TV. The door to the bathroom was open. I darted in, took the toothbrush and barely had time to swallow my D. Saliva deactivated its mechanism. The D was soft, but nearly a half inch square and it got stuck part way down my throat which gave my voice a strangled gasp when I turned to the two cops who filled the doorway. The door, <coughs> it was, <coughs> go down my throat, damn it, <coughs> open. I heard it, <coughs> a child. The D finally finished his trip down my gullet, crying, and I thought someone might need. I'd always been a more than passable actress. Jake would have been proud of me, or maybe not, given everything but I gave the cops the tremulous shakiness of a shy but compassionate middle-aged woman trespassing to save a child. I also had with me real trepidation creasing my face, a fake ID in my wallet that matched my fake retina scan, and fury in my blood for whatever missing agent of the org had put me in this position. If it had been an agent, the alternative was worse. Most of all, I felt fear, not for myself, but for the organization that always hovered between detection and ineptitude, the organization made of dedicated amateurs up against both law enforcement professionals and a stupid public, the organization that I would protect with anything in the world until we'd succeeded in our attempt to save that probably unworthy world from itself, whether it wanted that or not. Sometimes the world doesn't know what's best for it. Only one of the cops, the one in uniform, did the talking. Middle-aged and stocky, he balanced exasperation with boredom. A traffic problem didn't interest him much. It didn't interest the younger one either, 
who wore a suit and spent most of his time scrutinizing the inside of the lost house. His silky brown hair wanted cutting. It kept flopping over his eyes in, I assumed, a misguided attempt to look like the pop singer Canton Sparks. Not a chance. His eyes were the same blue, but his nose was too big and his lips too thin. Ah, vanity. They didn't keep me long. Quote, Caroline Denton, unquote, did not own a drivey house, had no priors, and possessed ID that matched her retina scan. She had a job with Dugan Brothers Temp Agency. Routine police wanding showed no electronic devices except a cell phone. By now, the D would have dissolved in my stomach acid into its nano components. But I would have been happier to talk to cops had I not been in my Caroline Denton identity. Much happier. However, I recorded a witness statement since abandoning a self-driving house to drive alone was a misdemeanor. Then I left, concealing how shaken I felt. Who was supposed to have been in the house? And where were they now? Arrested, kidnapped, defected? The problem, one of the problems with any modern resistance movement is that anything can be hacked, anything, as three presidential elections, the Wall Street Great Meltdown, the catastrophe, and Kitson's murder all proved. The reconstituted org takes no chances. None of our communications are electronic. We use couriers like me, and only if we have to, the US mail. We use verbal codes. We use methods that would be familiar during World War II, except that back then, they had radios and the mechanical enigma machine, and we don't even do that. We rely on our members' brains, also a fallible storage and communication system. But at least a hacker in China or at DAS or at one of the fanatical Luddite movements can't obtain documentation of what we're doing. They can, of course, obtain our actual brains. Where was the org agent who should have been in the wandering house? The new recruit would be waiting for me in Lincoln Park. He'd wait all day and night if necessary. If he didn't, he was no longer our recruit. I had three choices, leave him there, meet with him first and then go alone to report the wandering house to Kyle or grab the recruit and take him with me to meet Kyle. By the time I'd reached West Seattle, I had decided I would meet the recruit first. I have good instincts about people. Lincoln Park in October was lovely. Not New England lovely, where I'd gone to college. The Pacific Northwest ran more to coniferous trees than deciduous. But the park, bordering Puget Sound, had an unusual number of maples and birches, and I crunched through a colorful blanket of leaves on my way to the water. The air smelled earthy of pine and loam and somewhere a hint of mint. People passed me, walking dogs or holding hands, a few children running ahead and shouting. Cops patrolled to keep homeless encampments from forming on park grounds. A peaceful autumnal Eden, just as if the economy had not been nearly destroyed 10 years ago and was not still, for the bottom of the human pyramid, still an unholy mess. The recruit sat on the designated park bench facing the bay, exactly where he was supposed to be. I approached him from behind, scrutinizing carefully. He stretched out his arms, probably stiff from the long wait, and I saw the flash of the Tiffany Teal bracelet on his left wrist. Hello, I said and he rose and turned towards me. Sometimes not even superb and relentless training can keep shock from showing on your face, if only for a moment. The recruit registered it, for which I would have given him points if I hadn't for the second time in two hours, felt so shaken. He looked like Ian, an Ian who'd been allowed to grow up, who hadn't died during the catastrophe. The same dark hair curling over his ears, the same full lips and gray eyes flecked with gold. After that first shock, the differences became clearer. This kid at 23 was of course heavier and more muscular than Ian had been at 12. The recruit's ears struck out more, but he was a good looking young man and I felt a flash of utterly insane pride that my son might've grown up to look like this. Might've been the benefit to the world that this recruit, whom I would know only as Tom Fairwood, might be. Genes, even coincidental genes are funny things. And it was coincidental. Recruitment had checked out every single thing about Tom Fairwood, right down to his third grade report card and what he ate for breakfast, and he was in no way related to me. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here. I said, gorgeous view, isn't it? He said, I always find looking at this so calming. We went through all the rest of the inane identification protocol, and then I made my decision. 
Change of plans, Tom. You're coming with me. Has something happened that I'll tell you on the way? Come on. He strode along beside me, not asking further questions, just obeying. A good sign for a recruit. We walked to the car like two people, possibly mother and son, out to enjoy the weather, occasionally exchanging a trivial remark. In my car, Tom said, are we going to a station? No, you're going to meet our cell leader. He nodded and said nothing more until we pulled up to Kyle Washington's house in the Seattle suburb of Burien. It was not my job to train Tom. The recruiter, whom of course I didn't know, would have done that. Tom would already know everything important, why we were organized the way we were, the security measures we had to take, the reporting rules, the kinds of tasks he would perform. My job was to assign him those tasks. I was the third in command in our cell of the org, a grandiose position for a group of four people, now five. Only Kyle, our cell leader, knew where other cells were. If Kyle was hit by a bus, his second, quote, Jonas, end quote, would report to one of the scientists at one of the four stations that our cell covered and receive further instructions from him or, him or her. The org had to be set up that way. When its predecessor group hadn't been, soon after the catastrophe, the result was that the entire original group had been discovered and prosecuted under the RICO statutes. Some members had flipped, dozens had gone to jail, two people had committed suicide, and Dr. Eric Kitson, founder, had died in a hail of FBI bullets when he walked, unarmed but without his hands raised, out of a station. No FBI agents were ever prosecuted for that murder. For our carefully rebuilt resistance movement, secrecy and planning were key. A relatively small number of people can affect huge change if they're well organized. In 1917 Russia, just 23,000 Communist Party members eventually seized control of a government controlling 180 million peasants. A tiny handful of terrorists brought down the World Trade Center towers. In the org, the only name it had, recruitment was rigorous. No communications were digital. Everything was on a need to know basis and hardly anyone knew anybody else. Certainly I didn't. I didn't even know how big the org was in total, although I suspected it had grown pretty large since Kyle had once let slip a reference to regional headquarters, which of course implied a non-regional headquarters somewhere. That was a small nugget of knowledge that I was not supposed to have. Kyle, on the other hand, did not know about the much larger nugget of knowledge that I possessed, and I was not going to tell him. Kyle Tyrone Washington lived under his own name. A six foot two African-American NXFL, ex-NFL wide receiver is too noticeable to assume an alias. His wife, Susan, was in the front yard doing whatever you do to flower beds in October. It involved a rake, bags of organic looking stuff, and a wide straw hat. Susan wasn't one of us, and she didn't know what Kyle did when he wasn't as was his legitimate job, which was counseling troubled teens and their even more troubled parents in an office adjoining their small brick house. Carol, Susan said, stripping off her gardening gloves. How nice to see you. You too, Susan. This is Tom. Kyle probably told you about him. Oh yes, another chess protege, but I didn't realize you had a match this afternoon. Kyle doesn't, Tom and I do. Susan Washington, Tom Fairwood. I picked up Tom and since we passed you on our way into the city, I thought I'd introduce him to Kyle. If Kyle's between clients, if not, it can wait. I'll see. Susan smiled pleasantly at Tom and started for the offices. Susan was kind and curious and a little dim. I was always surprised that a man like Kyle chose a woman like her, but there's no predicting what strangely assorted couples will marry. Just look at Jake and me. Kyle and Susan emerged from his office. Susan said, can you stay for coffee? Thank you, I said, but we have a scheduled match. Kyle, Tom wants to ask you about Fisher's use of the x-ray attack in the 1963 championship match. Susan laughed. I'll leave you chess people to it. When she was out of earshot, Kyle asked, what happened? I told him, leaving out the toothbrush in my pocket. Kyle, do you know anything about that lost house that I should know? No, I'll find out what I can before the meeting tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, since he's here, you might as well take Tom to the station with you. Introduce him there. All right. I didn't ask if or why Tom could take an overnight trip on such short notice. 
If he had domestic complications, Kyle wouldn't have allowed me to take him. And I need another D, I said. I had to swallow mine at the wandering house. Kyle said, you go through a lot of those, Carol. They don't grow on trees, you know. Not yet. Ha ha, I said. Kyle gave his usual wintry smile. His face wore a permanently pained expression, even though he wasn't a pessimistic person. A passionate idealist, he thought that the org could succeed in its mission. I tried to share this belief because I so desperately wanted to. Sometimes I even succeeded. Kyle brought me another D from a safe somewhere deep in the house. Back in my car, Tom said, so do you know a lot about chess? Nothing at all, I said. I've memorized some sentences to drive Susan away. You'll need to do the same. I'll give you a, you don't have to, he said. I, hold, I held a 2100 ranking in college. I nodded and concentrated on driving to I-90, eyes on the road, expression blank. Ian too had played chess. After 10 years, grief was no longer a tsunami swamping everything else in my mind, but the slow dark tides that it brought were sometimes worse. And thinking of Ian meant inevitably, thinking of Jake, who would never see this kid beside me who looked so much like our lost son. Although considering everything that had happened both between us and around us, maybe it was a good thing that Jake would never see Tom Fairwood. But still, Jake's loss and mine, one of so many, starting from practically the day that Jake and I met. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you'll read it to find out what the org is doing and what the problems are with what the org is doing and what the other problems are that impinge on what the org is doing and how the whole thing comes out. Is the book out now? Yes, out. it is. It's a novella. This is it. It's a standalone novella. I, I can never get this right. There it is. Yeah. Hold on. I have, a, I have a link here. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. So you can get it at the, uh, the link below. Uh, it's in that uh, scrolling thingy, it's Chiron, whatever they call it. And then um, also in the in the YouTube link at the bottom and uh, on our, you know, obviously you don't have to get through Amazon, get it at your favorite bookstore if you prefer. Well, you can order it directly from Tachyon. We have there you a go. website. Excellent. Yes. Good. Um, so Amy did send us a photo of her Stein. So I could show you and there it is. Ouch. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Right. Are you drinking beer out of it, Amy, while you listen to us? I hope you are. We have to try to at least try to duplicate the KGB atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Have some Baltica. Yeah, only, like if the Russian really, Budweiser. only if they have the really dark Baltica. If they yeah. Don't so. um, all right. So we're going to take a, a quick five minute break. Uh, everyone can get a drink of water or your favorite beverage and then we'll be back in a couple minutes with kim stanley robinson so uh so hang around
Hello, we're back. Well, yeah, let's we're let's back. let's wait a, another minute or two because we did say okay. five. So. Okay, what is grass salt and sand mezcal margarita cider? Amy, oh, that's, that's really good. Who said that? that it, Amy, what the heck is it? Oh, I, we have some of that in the fridge. It's is it's it cider. Um, it's cider, yeah. It's it's. Um, oh wait, do we have that one? We have one of those in the fridge. Salt and sand is good. Yeah, it's uh, it's a cider. It's it's like a. Fl uh, I don't want to say it's flavor. I guess it is flavor. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. It's sand flavor. Sand, yes. Yeah. Right. Sour hard cider. Sure okay. that, I yeah, I haven't tried out if I can drink cider anymore. I'll have to try that. I need to experiment with what I can drink and can't drink. I Salt and it. sand is a terrible name for cider. I mean, it makes you think yeah. that it's either going to be salty, taste salty, or taste sandy. I think they're going for the beach vibe, like like the the salt uh, salt life is like beach life, salt and sand. You know, I should have thought of that since I live a block and a half from the beach. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even think of it. Well, it's it's better than like gravel and dirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> Much better. Yes, right. much better. Sure. Yeah. So before we have Stan reading, oh, by the way, Stan can't connect totally, um, which is why we only have his voice. It's going to be audio, although he's he's here live. Well, yeah. Live Hi, everybody. Sorry about <laughs> my non visual appearance. There he is. <laughs> For Farm and Fleur. Uh, okay. Anyway. Um, over the next few months, we still have virtual KGB for August 18th. We have A.C. Wise and Karen Lord reading. September 15th, we have Mari Ness and Ellen Clagis. And then again, um, starting October 20th, we hope we'll be in person with Mike DeLuca, Daryl Gregory. And in the future, we have Robert Reddick and we have David Leo Rice and N.K. Jemison. And uh, that's through the end of the year. Next year, we have Victor Laval and several people lined up. So that's what we've got coming up, hopefully in person and for virtual for the next couple of months. Anyway, Kim Stanley, I hope I didn't leave, leave any words out in this one. Kim Stanley Robinson is a multi-award winner of science fiction, probably best known for his Mars trilogy. His most recent novels are Red Moon and The Ministry for the Future. He lives in Davis, California, although he's currently on the East Coast in a secret spot. <laughs> that, has, uh, that has lousy internet. So please welcome Kim Stanley Robinson. <laughs> um, thank you, Ellen. It's not that secret spot. I'm on Mount Desert Island on the coast of Maine at my wife's family's place. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be doing a KGB reading, and I'm happy to be doing an event with um, Nancy Kress. We've been crossing paths for a long time now, and it's a real pleasure uh, and thoroughly enjoyed her read a, a few shows from the Ministry for the Future novel of mine, most recent, and it came out last October. So I'll start at the beginning and I'll, I'll mark for you when, um, when I'm shifting gears to a different chapter and kind of pop through most of the entire book, but only, only 20 minutes of it. So here's how it begins. It was getting hotter. Frank May got off his mat and padded over to look out the window. Umber, stuccoed walls and tiles, the color of the local clay. Square apartment blocks like the one he was in. Rooftop patios occupied by residents who had moved up there in the night, it being too hot to sleep inside. Now quite a few of them were standing behind their chest-high walls looking east. Sky the color of the buildings, mixed with white where the sun would soon rise. Frank took a deep breath. It reminded him of the air in a sauna, this the coolest part of the day. In his entire life, less than five minutes in saunas, he didn't like the sensation. Hot water, maybe. Hot, humid air, no. He didn't see why anyone would seek out such a stifling, sweaty feeling. Here, there was no escaping it. He wouldn't have agreed to come here if he had thought it through. It was his hometown's sister city, but there were other sister cities, other aid organizations. He could have worked in Alaska. Instead, sweat was dripping into his eyes and stinging. He was wet, wearing only a pair of shorts. Those two were wet. There were wet patches on his mat where he had tried to sleep. He was thirsty, and the jug by his bedside was empty. 
All over town, the stressed hum of window box air conditioner fans buzzed like giant mosquitoes. And then the sun cracked the eastern horizon. It blazed like an atomic bomb, which of course it was. The fields and buildings underneath that brilliant chip of light went dark, then darker still as the chip flowed to the sides in a burning line that then bulged to a crescent he couldn't look at. The heat coming from it was palpable, a slap to the face. Solar radiation heating the skin of his face, making him blink. Stinging eyes flowing, he couldn't see much. Everything was tan and beige and a brilliant, unbearable white. Ordinary town in Uttar Pradesh, 6 a.m. He looked at his phone, 38 degrees. In Fahrenheit, that was, he guessed, 103 degrees. Humidity about 35%. The combination was the thing. A few years ago, it would have been among the hottest wet bulb temperatures ever recorded. Now, just a Wednesday morning. Wails of dismay cut the air coming from the rooftop across the street. Cries of distress, a pair of young women leaning over the wall calling down to the street. Someone on that roof was not waking up. Frank picked up his phone from the box beside his mat, called the police. No answer. He couldn't tell if the call had gone through or not. Sirens now cut the air, sounding dead. With the dawn, people were discovering sleepers in distress, finding those who would never wake up from the long, hot night, calling for help. The sirens seemed to indicate some of the calls had worked. Frank checked his phone again. Charged, showing a connection, but no reply at the police station. He had had occasion to call several times in his four months here. Two months to go, 58 days, way too long. July 12, monsoon not yet arrived. Focus on getting through today, one day at a time. Then home to Jacksonville, comically cool after this. He would have stories to tell, but the poor people on the rooftop across the way and then the sound of the air conditioners cut off. Okay. A few pages later, um, in a different chapter entirely. Be it resolved that a subsidiary body authorized by this 29th conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Climate Agreement is hereby established to work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and all the agencies of the United Nations and all the governments signatory to the Paris Agreement to advocate for the world's future generations of citizens, whose rights as defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are as valid as our own. This new subsidiary body is furthermore charged with defending all living creatures, present and future, who cannot speak for themselves by promoting their legal standing and physical protection. Someone in the press named this new agency the Ministry for the Future, and the name stuck and spread and became what the new agency was usually called. It was established in Zurich, Switzerland in January of 2025. Not long after that, the big heat wave struck India. So, I read that in order to give you kind of the enabling device for this science fiction novel. Um, seems to me a science fiction um, event that the Paris Agreement, but it really does exist. So that's a good thing. I'm going to skip forward to the middle of the book now. Um, this is the Ministry for the Future in my novel is headed by a woman named Mary Murphy, an Irish woman. A diplomat, um, used to international relations and humanitarian efforts. And at the next section I'm going to read you has to do with um, a meeting with uh, the central banks. And it, I would suppose at this point, it might be five or 10 years after the establishment of the Ministry for the Future. And a lot of stuff has happened. So, hosting a meeting of a dozen or 20 of the most powerful people on earth, which meant also accommodating large staffs for each of them, was a big job, but one that the Swiss were used to performing. 
For this meeting, there were too many people for the ministry offices to hold, so they held the meeting in the Congress Halla, down by the lake. The morning they convened, the broad picture windows spanning the south wall of the big room provided them with the pathetic fallacy in full measure. A spring storm lashed the Zurich A, with low shifting gray clouds dropping black brooms of rain onto the silvery lake surface. The windows running wild with deltas of rainwater kaleidoscoping this view. Nothing unusual in that. No LA-like climate apocalypse here, just Zurich spring weather as usual. But still, very fitting, given the mood in the room, which is one of grim virtue. They would weather this storm, they said to each other while looking out at it, and all the stark emotion in the room was heightened by the dark metallic sublimity of the rain-lashed whitecaps on the lake the sound of the wind ripping through the flailing trees. Mary brought them to order. She reminded them of the meetings she had had with them over the past few years in which she had urged them to create a new currency of their own collaboration based on carbon sequestration and exchangeable on currency exchanges. Money, like other money, but backed by the central banks working together and securitized by the creation of really long-term bonds, bonds with a century payout, at a guaranteed rate of return large enough to tempt anyone interested in In essence, as she had been saying, creating a way to invest in survival, to go long on civilization, as opposed to the many ingenious ways that finance had found to short civilization. Thus, in the process, shifting most of the surplus value created in the last four decades to the richest 2% of the population making those few so rich that they could imagine surviving the crash of civilization, they and their descendants living on into some poorly imagined gated community post-apocalypse in which servants and food and fuel and games would still be available to them. No way, she said to the bankers. Not a chance that would happen. Shorting civilization and imagining living on in some fortress island of the mind was another fantasy of escape one of many that rich people entertained, as ridiculous as retreating to Mars. Money was worthless if there was no civilization to back it, no civilization to make things to buy, things like food. So even if the central bankers were regarding their task in the very narrowest terms, as they did, as stabilizing prices and helping the employment rate, and more than anything else, preserving the perceived value of money itself, to do that now, they had to leave their usual monetarist silos and regard themselves as what they were, the not-so-secret government of the world. In that capacity, something more was now called for than merely adjusting their fucking interest rates. Yes, and they were shocked by her bluntness, by her disgust for their timidity. These Irish, they were thinking, she could see that. But they were also paying very close attention to her. They were transfixed the storm outside forgotten. Now the storm is in the room in the form of one angry, intense, middle-aged woman. Well, she had to remember, when a meeting got hot, it was usually going badly. This was a calculated risk, getting their attention by lashing them a bit. Now she had to calm it down. So she did that. The last time she had asked them to do this, she reminded them, they had refused her. Now she told them the situation was different. It was so much worse, it could scarcely be believed. And as the current representative in their midst of all the future generations to come, she was going to have to insist that they act. She was, remembering what Dick had told her about letting them invent the instruments, open to their suggestions as to how best to act. Possibly the Bank for International Settlements could be brought out of its 20th century time capsule and used as the instrument at hand for this. And possibly the, the G7, possibly the G20, possibly the network for greening the financial system. Because whichever group did it, civilization was trembling on the brink. They were going down. They had to act. Here, the pathetic fallacy of an ordinary Zerker spring storm helped her to bring her point home. The wind was really howling now. The air was black, though it was just before noon. The whole lake was slamming into the windows and blurring the view. Then the wind clarifying it with a blast, time after time. 
It was almost as rainy as Galway. Okay, so that's about mid-book. And now I'm thinking, I'm gonna try something I haven't read before. It's been nine months since this book's been out and there are certain obvious set pieces to give people the, the uh, sense of what the book's about. But um, I'm ready for something different. There are 106 chapters in this book and I've probably only read about 10 of them um, a little repeatedly. So I'm gonna try something new because KGB is a special space. And I'm thinking that it would be fun to try something from very near the end um, when um, a little bit of a bend in the arc of history has been accomplished through a whole lot of Sturm und Drang as you can um, gather from the previous things I've read. Um, but very near the end, people are seeing a kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And I guess what I would like to say about this book is that I wanted to write out um, a kind of best case scenario for the next 30 years that you, the KGB listeners, that the science fiction community could still believe in. Uh, which is a pretty tough test to put to any future scenario. So um, that said, I'm going to drop into this chapter 103 out of the 106. I don't think anyone ever figured out who organized it. Whoever they were, they wanted to stay out of the way and have it look self-organized, have it emerge out of the zeitgeist. And maybe it did. I mean, ultimately, we all did do it together. It was already a feeling everyone had. I think something like 4 billion people tapped their phones to say they had taken part in it. Like New Year's Eve, except it was agreed it should be a simultaneous moment all over the earth, near the spring equinox in the Northern Hemisphere, like Nauru's or Easter. Having it be the same very moment for all seemed right. It was important to feel the connection with everyone and everything else as a kind of vibe. Kulike in Hawaiian, it means harmony. Or La Olulu Olu, Harmony Day. Evoke the new sphere. Call it into existence by everyone thinking of it at the same time. That's not a time-delayed thing. It has to be simultaneous. So we in Hawaii kind of got the shirt into the stick time-wise. The timing was presented as a given, which I think means that someone somewhere had to be doing it in terms of organization. But anyway, East Asia got the late night. Then going west, they went down through the time zones until Western Europe got noon. Then across the Atlantic, it got earlier and earlier across the Americas to a dawn patrol kind of thing on the West Coast. So we in Hawaii were looking at 3 a.m., I think it was. Fine, whatever, an excuse to stay up all night and party. And it has to be admitted that it was still nice and warm for us even in the middle of the night. So we could go to Diamond Head and look out over the ocean as we partied. And the moon was full that night. No coincidence, I'm sure. So it was nice. Down in the concert bowl, bands played through the night and we sat on the ridge talking and drinking and watching the ocean by moonlight. Good south swell, too. So that a lot of us were talking about going to Point Panic at sunup to catch some waves. Great way to finish this event, back in Mother Ocean where we all began. Slide offshore wind, too. So the time came and we listened to the voices on our phones. We are all children of this planet. We are going to sing its praises all together, all at once. Now's the time to express our love, to take the responsibilities that come with being stewards of this earth, devotees of this sacred space, one planet, one planet. On and on it went. It seemed clear to me that the original had been written in some other language, that we were listening to a translation into English. And in fact, you could tap around and hear what was being said in other languages. Gupta insisted on listening to it in Sanskrit, which he admits he doesn't understand when spoken, though he reads it. But he claimed that what we were hearing had to have been written or th thought originally in Sanskrit, maybe even thousands of years ago. And in fact, the Sanskrit version of it did sound very primal, which made me curious. And I clicked around and I found a version in Proto-Indo-European. Why not? It sounded like Spanish. I switched to Basque, supposedly a living fossil of a language, and it too sounded like Spanish. Actually, both sounded quite a bit stranger than Spanish, older than Spanish, odd, harsh, primal sounds, but no more so than Dutch or many another language that isn't Hawaiian. You always hear, 
hear all the same sounds. And no matter which language I tapped on, I kept hearing Mama Gaia. Yes, of course, Mama would be one of the oldest words, maybe the first word, invented over and over by babies trying their best to talk, but having limited control of their mouths, and yet always trying to say the same thing, to beseech or celebrate that great goddess filling their sight, the fountain and source of all food, warmth, touch, love, and eye contact. Mama! I cried out that night on the ridge, seeing the why of it for the first time, the why of everything. Of course, it's a category error on my part to genderize the planet in that crass way, but we were high that night on the worldwide love fest. And since everyone was singing and cheering and hooting as after having caught a great white and a great wave, I just kept sounding Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. Because of course, being human, the other first word we speak is always me, mine. Me, me, me. And God bless the Italians and whoever else in the Romance languages for holding fast to that very first er phrase. The same in all the languages. I checked Proto-Indo-European, and sure enough, it was the same there too. Mamma mia, mamma mia. Genius of a language. Yes, I was a little drunk, a little high, a little giddy. I mean, think about it. A worldwide moment during which all sentient beings aware of the project were to sing praise together to the one planet we stood on, to perform the noosphere created by this so vast and complex biosphere, where, while standing on the lithosphere and contemplating the hydrosphere and circulating the atmosphere in and out of us, breath after breath. It's great, but it's a little hypothetical too, right? It's hard to know how to feel it. What could we do in that moment but try? As a linguist, I naturally think of the words involved, but there was more to it than that, so I tried all that too. I drank, and I looked around at the faces of the other people on the ridge, all of them also trying, and many of them had their dogs with them there. The dogs, too, were trying, trying to understand it, very aware that something unusual was happening, such that some of them barked or howled, which some guys instantly took up. Of course it was time to howl, howl at the moon, like wolves. What a great language. And besides, we were like wolves. We turned wolves into dogs, and they turned us into humans. We were something like orangutans before, solitaries who didn't know how to work together. It was the wolves who taught us that, who taught us the idea of friendship and cooperation. So we howled at the moon and hugged the people around us, if they were hugging types, and the dogs. And I kept looking at all the faces, so vivid and real. And I kept coming back to saying, Mamma Mia, as one does when in awe hugging Gracie in particular, as always. We're lucky that way. This went on for about 15 minutes. Then we quieted down. Time to get back down into the bowl of the concert space and dance to the music for what was left of that night. Had we done it right? Had we joined with every sentient being on the planet, brought into existence a new earth religion that would change everything? Were we all brothers and sisters now, as they were always telling us we should be? Hard to tell. It felt like a lark. But larks are beautiful. All these bird and animal names we use for our moods and actions, of course they're always perfectly apt. We are all family, as the new religion was telling us, and as every living thing on Earth shares a crucial 938 base pairs of DNA, I guess it's really true. So yeah, we went down there and danced all night long, feeling very high, and when the sky lightened and dawn approached and they sent us out to greet the day and go home and do whatever we were going to do that day, they played Brada Is Israel Kama Kawiya Wolo's medley of Somewhere Over the Rainbow and What a Wonderful World, a great piece of Hawaiian schmaltz that we could sing along with on our way out and hum the rest of the day. Later, I read that people said they really felt it that moment when everyone worldwide sang the same song of praise and devotion. It was said to be like an electric pulse filling you, or like that. I must admit, I didn't feel anything like that in the moment itself. Maybe I was too drunk or too aware of Gracie's hand on my ass, but that morning I caught the longest left of my life at Point Panic, when Britta is his pair of tunes running in my head the whole time. What a wonderful world indeed. And I flew out of that wave just before it closed out. And up there in the air over the wave, suspended weightless with the offshore spray and not seeing the hukai rainbow because I was right there in it. Yes, that's when I felt it. Of course, it doesn't come on command or to a schedule. 
Grace isn't like that. It touches down on unexpected moments, a matter of accidents, but you have to be open to it too. So maybe that was it for me. A slight delay after the sacred ceremony, which maybe was the riding of that wave anyway. Anyway, I felt it then, hanging in the air. And then I crashed back down onto the white hissing backside and I swam head up, laughing out loud. Yes, it worked. Mamma mia. Thank you. People, are you still there? Oh, God. Hello. Hello. Stan, still there? That was great. Sorry about that, Stan. We're still here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I okay. think you came back. I was worried. Yes. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. No, that was great. We heard you the whole time. And uh, I, I really love that. Um, I actually didn't get didn't get to that chapter in the in the novel yet, so I was like, should I hold my ears? But I have to I have to uh, <laughs> I have to audio video engineer. Um, what I did was uh, to improve the bandwidth. I removed us from the stream, so it was just you. We were still in the in the green room, so to speak, but okay. not on the actual stream. Mm -hmm. So um, took me a second to get everyone back. So uh, yeah, that was great. Um, yeah. How can you be so optimistic about, anyway, that's my question. I, you know, it's, right. How do you maintain your optimism about humanity, Stan? <laughs> I can answer that very honestly with Mama Mia. My mom was an optimist by policy who instructed me that it was the only moral position to take. Um, that it didn't matter what the world was doing, that it was your duty to be optimistic and help other people. So um, mm -hmm. she was a great exemplary figure for me. Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for, for um, you know, so much of science fiction I read, you know, I read these days is like, just grim. I mean, some of it's really good and compelling, but also grim. So I just, I appreciate that your stuff is usually not, um, you know, although I will say like, I thought you were going to read and I'm not gonna spoil it for people who haven't read the book yet, the um, the section at the beginning in India where the power goes out, I was like, oh my God, that's such a, <laughs> that's a hard <laughs> chapter. Is that the one you're gonna read? So no, I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that you, uh, you, only, you gave us a taste of that. So uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, so if, you, if anyone has questions for, for uh, Kim Stanley Robinson or Nancy Kress, please, please ask them in the, in the live YouTube comments. Um, we, you can ask them now. Uh, we have a few questions we're going to ask them as well, I think. Um, so I have, I have one for Nancy, actually. Um, so uh, I, I think I was saying before the, the live stream started that um, – you know, I, I took a class at the new school a long time ago, and uh, your your book was the textbook there. Like that was the, the book. They're like, you need to have. I think it was beginning, middles, and endings, right? That. And um, tell me, how did you get into teaching writing? How did you get into doing that stuff? I've always been a teacher. After college, I taught the fourth grade for four years. And then I moved on to teaching college, getting more degrees, and then moving on to teaching college. Um, the books on writing came out of the fact that for 16 years, I was the fiction columnist for Writer's Digest magazine. Um, Lawrence Block got tired of doing it, so they asked me to write that column, and I did. So then they said, well, can you collect these columns into, into a book, only we don't want it to just be the columns. We want you to write a book that's sort of like the columns, but isn't the columns. So after we got the actual meaning of that rather cryptic message straightened out, um, I wrote that book and it's been in print ever since, which has been a long time. From which I conclude that a lot more people want to learn how to write fiction than maybe to actually read fiction. Hmm. That's well, another conclusion. <laughs> there it is. There's Sophie. Sophie's behind me. Hello, Sophie. Um, we have a question here from Linda Addison uh, for both guests tonight. Um, since you both have written 
SF in the future, I'm curious about when they started these books slash inspiration that sparked these two not so future books. I'm not sure if I understand that. You mean near future, near future, near future. Yeah. When they started these books, the spark. Oh, oh, I see. When when you started these not so future books, okay. And then she follows up with, since we're now on a planet that is currently challenging human survival with real virus and climate change. Uh, do either one of you stand? I talk about the near future a lot because, well, for two reasons. The lazy reason is that it's easier in one sense because you don't have to invent an entirely different world. You have a world right here ready to use um, with some changes, which will have other ramifications, but you're not trying to invent an entirely different society. To write really good far future science fiction is an enormous challenge. Yes. Because not only do you have to have a new world, all the pieces have to link together. The other more compelling reason that doesn't have to do with my laziness is that the near future is going to be in many ways an intensification of the problems we're facing right now, as Stan's excerpt just showed about climate change. Although the excerpt I read of my book didn't go into enough detail or didn't go far enough to become aware of this, it's about... Um, food security problems and genetic engineering of crops. And because these things, and which is tied to Stan's concern, because the reason that there's food security in my future is insecurity, is that with the climate changing, crops won't grow where they used to grow, not the same ones. Right. So when you look at something and you think this is going to be a real crisis, and it's going to be a crisis soon because it's already starting that way, it provides a natural jumping off point for conflict, for characters, for the kind of things that make good fiction. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I would say also that Nancy has been uh, exemplary in working in the near future science fiction. And, um, and she's right, far future science fiction is both hard and also um, distant. So it's not that great stories can't be written there because they can, and they can even illustrate um, various kinds of moral questions in a, in a way that's both entertaining and um, done in bold so that you can see the issues better. Uh, I myself have never managed to write a science fiction story more than 300 years out, and that was a gigantic stretch, um, except for one time travel story where I, I really pushed it, but that's what time travel can do for you. Mostly I've focused on the next couple centuries, and that's a big zone in itself. But in in the time of our working careers, um, um, climate change has taken over the near future, so that if you decide to write about the near future, you kind of have to write about climate change because it's, it's going to happen. It's already started, and you can't dodge it. So um, in a way, it's a it's a powerful thing where science fiction has become the realism of our time. And in a way it's kind of a restriction where you're, you're the freedom of imagination to imagine any kind of future is kind of gone for us. Um, I, I wrote the ministry for the future in, in 2019. And I want to say that was a darker time than now because we have a new political administration that is much bolder and more realistic about climate change. And also, because the pandemic has slapped us in the face. Everybody on earth is aware they're in a science fiction novel now and that we're on one planet and, and uh, anybody on the planet can get sick from this one disease and it's accelerating. Not alas, alas, not quite everybody. Well, well no, but, but even denying it are only denying it by a force of political willpower, which of course people are very good at. But I would say this, that um, the timeline in my novel has been, you can throw it out the window. Things that I, I projected happening a decade or two out are going to happen in the next couple of years. And some of the things I wrote about are already uh, happening, even though I projected them as happening in the 2030s, 2040s. So I think uh, it, um, our history has been accelerated in the a way that's interesting. The heartbreaking thing is that we knew this was coming. Yeah. I remember being in elementary school and them starting to talk about um, 
how fossil fuels were changing the the atmosphere. At that point, a lot of attention was being paid to those things that were causing problems with the ozone hole. Right. But ozone. It, it just went, it was there then. And as for a pandemic, epidemiologists have been saying for 50 years that there's another one coming. I remember reading a book written 20 years ago by Laura Vieira, The Next Coming Epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually outdated now, but it was there. And I have written about pandemics more than once, future pandemics. The problem is that people often don't want to hear this because it's not fearful. They don't, they equate you with the people who are walking around Broadway with signs saying, the end is near, the end is near. And that's not the case. There are measured responses, things you can do that you can look forward and, and, and take and do um, without actually becoming a total pessimist. Yeah, and I think also there's a lot of propaganda from industry to convince people that somehow switching, let's say, to a renewable economy is going to hurt X, Y, and Z, and they'll just drill that in over and over again. And certainly there's going to be a shift in jobs. Certainly, you know, some people may lose their jobs. I mean, they're, you know, Oil drilling is is not something that if I were a twenty year old I would want to go into right now. I think that would be oh stupid, stupid or cold, a stupid career choice. But if you were you know forty five or fifty and you've been doing it your whole life, I could see the concern in 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 that. But I, I feel like the fear of it that's been drilled into people of like switching to a renewable economy is just it's overblown. And I think there's also a huge potential to provide uh, jobs and benefits to society that, mm -hmm. um, that we ignore. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Stan. Are you still with us? Yes, I sure am. Okay, good. Um, so one of the things that, uh, I, I'm not done with the Ministry for the Future yet, but um, there, there's an aspect to it where, and I think you kind of uh, almost read the, I think there's an, another section where Mary's with the bankers, but where she, she postulates a, um, a cryptocurrency call that, which I think they end up calling the carbon coin. And I was just wondering, like, what what's your thoughts? Like, do you think that that is something that we may may have in the future? Like, will we um, pay people to to keep um, carbon in the ground? I hope so. I think it's one of the only ways forward where we don't where we can avoid disaster. Um, the idea comes from uh, many sources. One of them, for me, writing my book, a paper by Delton Chen that you can find online, um, such that uh, and now also this network for greening the financial system is a real organization. Eighty nine of the central banks of the world, including all the big ones gathered together to see how to green the financial system. They have a paper out with nine recommendations. The carbon coin is either a symbol of those nine recommendations or else it's a 10th recommendation that they haven't got to yet. I don't have the technical expertise to be sure about that. But, but uh, what's interesting is that they are on it. And really carbon quantitative easing is something that the new Biden 3.5 a trillion um, infrastructure bill is concerned with the Green New Deal, the European Green New Deal. They're all paying people to do good carbon work, decarbonization, carbon sequestration. Whether that will extend to paying the people who own fossil fuels to not burn it, I don't know. It seems to me that ought to happen, that the oil companies ought to be paid to pump carbon dioxide back into the ground using their same technology, et cetera. Um, it's, I, I, I can emphasize something that I think all of you in this audience know, or at least the KGB regular audience, that a science fiction writer generally is a kind of reporter, not um, making up new ideas, but rather reporting on new ideas that you find from the scientific community and then put them into a book and pretend they already happened. And in this case, the carbon coin is 
is not my idea. And, and the last thing I want to say about that is that it's not really a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, which is like anti a carbon coin in that you right. burn carbon to make Bitcoin and nobody and Bitcoin isn't real money anyway. It's a speculative bubble. Um, it, it, the carbon coin would have to be fiat money uh, backed by central banks and real, something that you could call essentially or trade for U.S. dollars. So it, it needs to be official and not uh, not a cryptocurrency. Yeah. I feel really stupid. Well, why isn't that just credit? Credit cards. Uh, I mean, what? I mean, I, I really don't know anything about the science, but... No. Is credit cards not using carbon. I mean, it's you know, if you don't, it's not printing money. It's all electronic. So how is that different from? All money is electronic now. I mean, really, as everybody's noticed, paper money's going away. Coins, um, they're numbers in a, in a system. And the more you think about that, the weirder it gets. It, it's a system of mass um, hypnosis or mutual trust. Everybody trusts money. That's bizarre, and it means that in a, some super deep sense, everybody trusts each other uh, or has to. Yeah. So yeah, it's not about, uh, but you're right. It's the same as all other money. It's just that when the governments make up money in the first place, they would pay it first to decarbonization work. And then it would circulate in the general economy afterwards with what Keynes called a multiplier effect. So, okay, we had carbon, we had quantitative easing after 2008 to keep the economy from crashing. They made up like $13 million from scratch and pumped it into the system, but they gave it to the private banks to do the same silly things they were doing before, essentially gambling and enriching themselves. But in this case, with carbon quantitative easing, the new money that the government's made up, and really, when the Biden administration says we're going to spend $3.5 trillion in order to do good things, that money is not coming from any pre-existing source of money. They're making it up. And we, we have to understand that and accept that to be the case. When that new money that governments make up is spent for decarbonization and for good biosphere work, then we're paying ourselves to do the good stuff rather than ripping the earth off. So I this need, is the big change. I think we need better propaganda for the Biden administration for this stuff. It, it, yes. Yeah. Democrats definitely need better PR. I've got to say, they're doing pretty damn good compared to in the Obama or Clinton years. Uh, the, Biden, the Biden brain trust is the best brain trust that we've seen since FDR. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, they have to walk a, a narrow line, I think. Uh, yes. I, I think that if they try to go too fast, too quickly, you're going to get a lot of pushback. And I think they're doing a great job. I'm just saying they need, I think they need to communicate better with the general public as to what this all means <clears throat> and their advantage of, for us, for everybody to do that, to, to push for this. I agree. Yes. That's what I mean, that's what I mean. Not that they're not trying, that they don't have good ideas, yeah. but they've got to communicate them better to, to the idiots like us. And especially the other idiots that not like us. <laughs> 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 um, Nancy, we have a question. Ellen and I want to ask you, uh, why do you write about genetic engineering so, so much? <laughs> well, in a way we've already answered that question because yeah. it's coming. This is in fact here. And there's an awful lot of ridiculous fear out there. Um, in Europe, genetically engineered crops are referred to often as Franken foods. And as a result, I remember that William Sapphire, not my favorite writer, but he had a very interesting essay called A Monstrous Prefix is Stalking Europe. And that, that's kind of what it is. They're calling it something that it's not. Yes, we have bred we have bred using other methods, crops for millennia. Corn, for instance, that you eat on your table and corn and cow can no longer reproduce naturally. It has to be um, helped along with it because it can't just drop its seeds and grow corn. We, we've bred that out of it without genetic engineering. So yes, we're changing things, but we have to do this because first of all, as I said, the climate is changing and things that needs to grow where they did are not going to be growing as the as some places become drier, some places become with rising oceans, water, some coastlines become brackish. And we have to do this. Also, 
the population of the earth is growing and we will not be able to feed everybody if we don't. We have the luxury in the United States of saying, well, I'm not going to have any GMO food. I'd rather have something natural. Much of the world is, is not going to have that luxury. They don't have it now, and they're really not going to have it. If we don't get in there and change crops in a way that they can be more adaptable, hardier, with greater yields, and with greater nutrition quality. And this is partly a political problem, and partly a scientific problem, and partly a public perception problem. But when I wrote Sea Change, I wanted to be fair and hit both sides of the equation. What can go wrong and what can go right? You spoke a little earlier about enjoying the fact that much of Stan's work ends up, is optimistic. I'm going to do something different here, not pessimism, and but not optimism either, for a balanced look at a very difficult topic and a very misunderstood topic within the context of, of what I hope is an enjoyable story. I want to back up what Nancy said and just say that she's on to something really important here, that if you follow the science, we have always hybridized plants the entirety of human history. We have better instruments for it now, but it's not substantially different from just cross-pollinating. And these genetically modified organisms are going to help feed the world. Um, I have a friend at UC Davis who her genetically engineered rice can be in flooded for two months instead of two weeks before it dies. There's five million acres of it in Bangladesh and, and in the Philippines. It's all open source. When people object to GMOs, they're usually objecting to capitalism, to Monsanto owning genetic information. Right. If it's open source, if everybody owns it, if it's for the good of humanity, and this is what I think Nancy has been bringing up that's really important. So I just want to back that 100%. Okay. We have a question from the audience. Yeah, we have a question from Gregory uh, Bruno. It's uh, two parts, so I'll just read them both. Uh, Gregory Bruno says, this question is for Stan. I really appreciate how much attention your work pays to bureaucracy and infrastructure. We tend to think of world building in sci-fi as something different. How do you go about building these complex political and economic worlds that undergird your fiction? Well, I, I go on at stupendous length in a ways that are crazy and that no other fiction writer would undertake and no editor particularly likes. So um, now <laughs> it's part of my brand to be that crazy and think that bureaucrats can be interesting. Um, I'm married to a technocrat, a scientist at US Geological Survey. I've spent a fair amount of time at the National Science Foundation. And I have a huge admiration for our federal government, uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people when it's going right. And of course it can be bought and it's a big battle to keep that statement true. So um, I've thrown the dice, I've taken a risk. And here's where being a science fiction writer helps. You have the American and British and really worldwide science fiction community willing to follow you into crazy areas and to read about scientists and technocrats and, and read um, eccentric writers that are obviously uh, kind of crazy like me and, um, and be generous enough to follow that kind of a story along like uh, Gregory Bruno. So um, there's no particular trick involved except to go ahead and slow down and take the time to, um, uh, what can I say, have faith that these stories are interesting stories, that we've had enough car crashes or that the movies are better at explosions and car crashes. Than, than the written word on the page can be, and that the written word on the page has other things that it can do well. So I, I, ever since Red Mars, so now it's been 30 years, I've been rolling the dice on that particular move. And, you know, I have a high negative as well as a high positive. It's a controversial move, but you can't please everybody. And um, it's what I've tried, and, and I'm just very grateful to the to the science fiction community and to the audience that I do have that's followed me along with that with that strategy. Yeah, I think it was it uh, your your novel New York 2140 where you have these like interstitial chapters where 
the narrator says, you can skip this if you want. <laughs> yes, yes. The citizen is a very gnarly New Yorker. And as a Californian, what I realized is that we all have an inner New Yorker that if you let that inner New Yorker start talking, everybody knows the voice, everybody knows the accent, everybody knows the style, the aggressiveness. And so I had a great pleasure in writing those chapters. And of course, the citizen is very in your face about what he's doing in his expository lumps. His, he yeah. says info dumps, which is a term that I hate. And I'm gonna dump right on your carpet, he said. <laughs> All right. Uh, this question is from Linda Addison for for uh, for both of you. Um, so, uh, question for both. I appreciate that both authors have characters in their books that don't look like them. Can you talk about the process of writing them? Do you have others read your work, etc.? Well, Linda, you were one of the people that read mine <laughs> when I wrote um, Stinger which has as one of its point of view characters, a black female scientist who works at the CDC, an epidemiologist. I'm hoping that you remember that you read it for me because I wanted a couple of, of um, black friends to go over and see whether I had made any egregious or embarrassing or awful or offensive errors. And the only thing you told me was I got the hair all wrong and to lose the sunscreen. So yes, I do have people. Um, Wait a minute, they, what? Why, you were one of them. why lose the sunscreen? Pardon? Lose the sunscreen? Well, Linda told me that that I needed to do that, yes. You mean black people don't need sunscreen? You're going to get sunburned. That's what she told me then. Linda. Then she told me. <laughs> I want to hear uh, what, what about you, Stan? Yeah, well, thank you for that, Linda. It's, a, it's an important um, question because um, I am an aging white, straight American man. And um, if I couldn't write from the viewpoint of other people on this planet, my fiction would be much more boring. And um, a fiction writer needs to imagine the other. That's absolutely um, fun foundational and important that we all are given each other the freedom to imagine the other. Whether you can do it well or badly is a is a test of the of the emergency broadcast system, really. And I do share my work um, in Ministry for the Future. I've only spent eight hours in India in the New Delhi airport waiting for a flight. So when I wrote about a heat wave there and then decided I needed to go back to India frequently to stick with India after that originary disaster that starts my novel. Um, I shared it with acquaintances and friends who were from India. And it's just like Nancy said, I got a lot of help on small things that hadn't occurred to me and a lot of encouragement of people saying, yeah, go ahead, give it a try. It's, uh, whether you get it right or wrong, the important thing is to try. So as a fiction writer, that I think is uh, a crucial kind of existential uh, position for me. I need to be able to at least try to uh, imagine the other without um, offending people in some philosophical way. Okay, so Linda says that the, the sunscreen thing was within the context of the story. I'm sure it was. This was a long time ago. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, thank you, Melinda. Okay. Mm. Um, so we're coming up on uh, 830. We just want to know if people have any other questions for our guests tonight, Nancy or Stan, or if either of our guests have questions for each other. Uh, no. No pressure or anything. I, I have a question for Nancy, and it goes back to uh, Beggars in Spain, one of your greatest and most famous novels. Um, because I'm an insomniac, and I've often thought um, that your novel was in some ways uh, not a horror story, not in the kind of thing that Ellen edits, but more um, uh, a scary story because um, sleep to me is such a blessing. And so your novel explored that. And I guess I just wanted to ask you about your, you know, your current views on sleep. <laughs> it's a little I'm general. The, I'm at the opposite end of the scale from you. Betters in Spain is about people genetically engineered to not need to sleep. I'm a lone sleeper. If I don't get eight hours a night and preferably nine, um, I just don't function well. 
And I have been jealous my entire life of people I know who can get by or five or six hours of sleep a night. They get more sleep, they get more life than I do because yeah. I'm spending it asleep. Yeah, so but you're dreaming, but you're dreaming. It's not the same. Dreaming <laughs> the kids raised or the money earned or the floor mopped or the novels written for that matter. So I, I wrote it out of jealousy. That's what I wrote that book out of, jealousy of people who can actually get by with less sleep. Oh yeah. I need eight hours too. Or if I get less than seven, I'm a mess. <laughs> and wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to do it at all? No, I kind of like the idea of sleeping and being totally unconscious. Conscious. When I was a single mother with two small children and two jobs, I would have given anything to not have to sleep. Yeah. Well, it's a great book and it's a great exploration of that whole topic. I kind of like my sleep. I am insomniac, but I do need my eight hours. So when I have my bad nights, I plot my novels and then the next day I have to nap extensively. Well, when you've got a daytime job, that's not so easy. Yeah. So it's been a messy aspect of my life. And it's a, and, it, and you know, the truth is there's not that much science fiction that has gone into something that takes up a third of your life. So I think you caught a, uh, an important topic there that people haven't figured out is a great um, subject for stories, especially science fiction stories. There's more research than there used to be. They've lo located at least two genes that seem to influence um, that short sleepers seem to have in more than just by chance. And um, the, it, we're a long way from being able to do anything about this, but there is more research going on than there used to be. Yeah, I do envy people who seem to get, who love to like have three hours of sleep or five hours of sleep and are perfectly And fine. they're fine and they do a day and, and, they, and they get so much work done. It's like, yeah, and they're, they're, yeah, I'm totally dating, you know? yeah. And at a certain point, I just can't get so fuzzy brained, I'm done. I can't do anymore. Um, all right, I have one more question for each of you and then uh, I think we'll call it. What What's next from, from you guys? What do you have coming out or what are you working on? I don't talk about work in progress, so I'm not going to. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, Stan? I, yeah, I have um, substantially finished um, my first nonfiction book. It's about hiking in the Sierra Nevada of California. So it's part memoir, part geology, part history. It's a, it's a, it's a mess. <laughs> um, I'm scaring myself because I feel like I know how to write novels, but I don't know how to write uh, about myself and I feeling like um, um, writing about my Sierra life has been um, hugely stimulative and interesting. I've wanted to do it all my life and now I've finally done it. So that will be out in May of 2022. Um, and do you have a title it, yet? Yeah, it's called The High Sierra, A Love Story. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, unless there are other questions that come in in the last second. Uh, oh, Melinda Ray Allen says, there's also a type of inherited familial yep. insomnia. It's generally fatal. Yes, fatal I wrote about that in a story My called Path Pathways. When I discovered that, I was just horrified. And I wrote about it in a story called Pathways that's in my The Best of Nancy Kress because it just completely horrified me that people who can't sleep at all, but they're not genetically engineered. So this is, I mean, they just can't. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's, it's very rare and it runs in families. It's genetically traced and it is almost always fatal. Wow. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a gonna, minute. Wait a minute. I want a good night's sleep tonight. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. I just want to go back to that disease one more time. So <laughs> at what age does it become fatal? I mean, can they live with it till they're 20 or 30 or 40 and then they drop dead? I don't understand. Somewhere in their 20s or 30s, it tends to induce first madness and then... Um, Death, yes. So do that many of them reproduce? Well, yeah, if you're going to live till you're 30, you have time to do that. But again, it's very rare, and it runs in families. And right. not everybody I'm knows saying family. family knows they're going to get it. It's just that, you know, it's like do you decide to have a child if, if you know that you're going to, your child is going to die at 25? Well, maybe Didn't it's the same for that in story of your life? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that, I mean, you know all kinds of diseases that you know that someone's going to get 
it is a, it's a it's an ethical a moral decision to have a child that's going to have it i guess if we well, don't know that the child will have it because why not if it's i mean if it's genetic don't they have te well now don't they genetically test for it now of now maybe they can they haven't been able to because with any genetic disease um it depends on the way the genes flow right and even if it's dominant one fourth of your kids if you have enough of them won't have it because they will have two recesses oh right okay so then you're throwing the dice you're throwing the dice yeah yeah okay all right well that's interesting okay so on that note <laughs> on that note yes thank you everybody uh, thank you everybody uh thank you nancy thank you stan great and thank, thank you, you, Ellen and, and Matt, for having us. Yeah, and thank you, Ellen and Matt. Thank you, Nancy. Fun to do something with you. Say hi to Jack. Yeah. You, well, uh, don't, don't hang up yet. Please, uh, Stan. Yeah, don't yeah. hang up yet, uh, Stan and Nancy. We're going to hang out in the green room after the broadcast ends just for a minute. Um, but uh, good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for donating. And uh, we'll, see you we'll see you next month. Yeah. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Bye now.